So we're really excited about this series, Going Deeper. And me, when I'm preparing for a sermon, I think God is alive and active through the whole process. So for me to really work ahead in the sense of saying every detail of every word I'm going to say, every thought I'm going to capture, having that all planned out several weeks or several months in advance, a little challenging to me because I think God is always in the mix and doing things. So in opening this series, I want to tell you a little story that happened last night with Sophia as she was laying down, closing her eyes, going to sleep, and we were about to pray. I don't know about you, but in our house, when you're about to pray, settle down, everything's calm and quiet and the night's about to settle in. Then it's those times where the big philosophical questions come out. Daddy, I was just thinking about this. And then you get brought into it and half an hour later, you know, they're still awake and you're still talking about this stuff. So I'm putting Sophie to bed last night, praying for her. And she brings up this question. She says, so how do we really know the Bible's true? Good grief. I got to go. I, I can't. I, I don't know. I don't know. It caught me off guard. Right. So I'm thinking through that question. I'm like, that's a great question. Fantastic question, actually. And we're not going to cover that this morning. But I said, you know what? In a couple of days, uh, life slows down. Let's talk about that because it's a very perceptive question. And I want to speak into that. So she rattles off a few more things. And then she says, you know what I want to do? I wish I wish I could just erase my memory. Just erase it. Everything that I've been taught, just want to get rid of it. And I want to read the Bible and I want to go start to finish. How long will that take me, Daddy? And I said, I don't know. Maybe we can work out some kind of plan. She said, OK, I wish I could really do that, though. Just clear it all out and read the text. I was a proud dad at that moment because I think she's doing something that she doesn't know she's doing. And it's something that we kind of want to do with this series. So over the next few weeks, as we look at Galatians chapters three and chapter four, I hope you will take this seriously. Not that you don't, but I want you to up your game, if you will, in terms of your prayer life or your personal life. Really engage this text, because I think we're going to read some stuff that chances are in your D group, this chapter three, the first part of it, it may be one of those chapters where you're reading it, and especially if you're connected to a D group and you don't get your journal in until like nine or 10 in the evening and you're reading through this text, you're going to be like, I don't know. Yeah, God's good and all that. And you sign your name to it. This uses some language, some thoughts, some concepts that challenges us to actually go deeper with our understanding of the text, not what we've always been taught, but with the text itself. So sometimes when we do this, maybe you don't know what's happening, just like Sophie does it, but she's using some technical language without using the technical terms. This is what we call erasing your mind, just being true to the text. Maybe some of you have heard the word exegesis. Monty exegetes when he preaches up here or eisegesis. Uh, In America, 21st century, it's so easy to do eisegesis, which simply means to put into the text. In other words, you and I, we approach the Bible as something that we can read into and we filter it through our experience. We want to flip that. We want to exegete the text, which means we draw out. We want to come to it as pure as it is, the word of God, and draw out meaning from that and allow it to shape who we are. Even the parts that sometimes we want to hide keep hidden, not only from other people, but from ourselves and from God, which is kind of awkward because you know you really can't do that. So as we go deeper, you think the Blurred series messed with you. Sometimes when you go deeper with a random text like Galatians 3 or 4, it can really mess with you. It can mess with you, especially if you're really into like politics. It can mess with you if you're really into like other religions or philosophical thought. It can mess with you if you haven't had a pattern of approaching the text instead of just saying, I'm going to read into this and try to find something that really works for me. If you haven't had a pattern of saying, no, I'm going to read this and see what it really has to say to me, it can really mess with you. So we're going to go deeper. Uh, This guy, Robert Mulholland, wrote a great book, and he talks about it, and he talks about two kinds of reading. He says there's information. You read for information. And if you approach the text from this standpoint, like an informational reading, chances are you're reading as much as you possibly can, 
as quickly as you possibly can. I do this in the news every morning. You know, I scan the news stations. I'm looking for the headlines. I'm reading an article. If it doesn't catch my attention, if it's not something I'm interested in, I'm done as much as possible, as quickly as possible. Sadly, as a pastor, I know that it's so easy for you and for me to read the Bible like this. I got to get through this. I've got to read this chapter or I got to stay on track for this. And it's just informational, if you will. And then he says, actually, there's another way of reading the Bible. And it's all about transformation. And that's where you slow down and you come to the text and you read it. And if need be, you reread it. And if need be, you read it again. This is where you open your Bible and you read and you have your hands open wide and you say, God, what is going on here? What does this have to say to me? I love how Mulholland puts it in his book. He says, sometimes we approach the Bible like it's, it's the text, it's an object and it's out there. It's on your shelf, it's on your table, it's on your desk and it's out there and it's like, it's, oh, like we have control over it. We control our approach, our interaction, and we actually try to control the impact that it has on our lives. So we move from transformational reading to information. And we know the Bible says this, but we don't consider what that actually means for me here today. Now, this is a problem because the Bible actually says of itself, Hebrews chapter four says, the word of God that we call our Bible, this text, it's alive, it's active, it's not dead literature, if you will. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Now, someone said, the word of God is intrusive. And when you approach the text and you surrender to God's movement in your life, and you say, God, what does this have to say to me? What is this saying to me? God, what are you saying to me through this passage? You can ask yourselves, hey, when I'm interacting with the text, why do I feel this way? What's going on in my mind as I actually read through this? Am I also working out the grocery list too? Am I considering my calendar as I work through this? Or am I really engaged? What's stirring within me? What are my reactions to what I'm reading? You go a little further and you say, why? Why is this messing with me the way that it is? I love that kind of reading. And it's important. It's important because 2 Timothy chapter 3, all scriptures God breathed. It's useful for teaching. We get that, right? But it's also useful for rebuking for correcting and for training, or maybe your text, your actual translation says, instruction in righteousness. That's what the Word of God is for. It's to teach us, and when need be, to rebuke us, and when need be, to correct us, and when need be, to really train us in this idea of righteousness. In this word here, this is why we are in Galatians chapter 3 this morning. This idea of righteousness. And a few months ago, I don't know if you remember, I think you take really, really good notes, right? You can flip over that right now, preached in July. Can you flip over to there? You got that handy? I planted a little seed for you talking about this idea of righteousness. And we defined it as this concept. It's this defining moment. It's not something that makes us think holy or sacred, if you will. It's this defining moment where God takes it upon himself and does something only he can do where he puts you and I in a right relationship with himself. That's what righteousness means. So once you and I get put in this right relationship, how do we live in it? That's why Timothy says the Bible is useful for instruction or training in how we live in this new state, if you will. So some people come along and in Galatia, Paul had worked with these churches. He had preached to them. He had taught them about Jesus. He had taught them about this moment where they were put right with God. And then some people come along and they start confusing them. 
They're teaching some other stuff that's messing with the stuff they've always heard, and it's throwing them into confusion, if you will. So Paul comes along and he writes this text called Galatians, and it's his response to some of this teaching that's going on. And we're going to get to the specific teaching in just a moment, but I want to point out what he says in chapter 3, verse 1. He says, hey, you foolish, that's his word, not mine, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? What's going on here is that they had believed something. And now someone's teaching something else. And it's not true. It's not valuable. It's not helpful. But they're buying into it. They're leaning into it, if you will. And this word he uses for foolish. Now, again, if you've got kids in here, sorry, parents, uh, coach them up that you don't usually use this word. and You probably don't use it in your house or whatever. But you do a word study on it. And some people will arrive at the conclusion that it basically means, in our vernacular of the day, stupid. He's saying this move you're making and how you're processing the text is stupid. Who said this? What did they say that got your attention? Because what you're doing is foolish. It's stupid. Do you know the issue at hand? He leans to it in verse two. Verse two. He says, hey, I want to know one thing. One thing I just want to know from you. Did you receive the spirit? You're Christians, you're Christ followers. You've been put in a right relationship with God. Did you receive this spirit? Did this righteousness happen by observing the law or by believing what you heard. And that's where we enter the story. And that's the question I would pose to you. So when you think about your relationship with God, when you think about being here this morning, when you think about being a Christian or being put in a right right relationship with him, did that happen because of all this stuff you did? Did that happen because you earned it? And God, you got God's attention. He noticed you. Or did it happen because you believed? You see, the Galatians didn't have the old covenant, the Old Testament. They didn't have the law. They weren't exposed to these ideas of the sacrificial system or these dietary codes where they had to eat certain kinds of hot dogs. They had to do the beef, not the pork. They weren't exposed to, hey, honoring the Sabbath. They weren't exposed to this idea of being circumcised. That wasn't their badge of identity, if you will. That wasn't their covenant. They didn't have that law. They simply heard the message of Christ on the cross, Jesus Christ crucified. And you'll know, you'll hear people say all the time, when the word of God is preached, God begins to work on someone's heart and mind. He shows them just how far they've strayed, where life is off, where he can teach them, correct, rebuke, and train. And we buy into that message and we believe it. And then he declares us righteous and we have that relationship. That's what's going on. That's what happened for the Galatians. But now some people are coming along. They're like, hey, it's not working. You actually need to get circumcised too. And they're buying into it. So it'd be like kind of you like today. Um, however you're dressed. Who are the jeans people? Jeans? Next week, Monty's up here and he says, actually, you're at a point now where you can handle a little bit more. We're going even deeper. We need you in slacks. Any t-shirts? We need you in ties. I don't know what you do for the gals. Maybe a blouse, nice coral design, something like that. But we need you to up it. You've got to shift because there's there's more to it than just what you heard. Now, how many of you would say, oh, that's foolish? That's what's going on in Galatia. It's kind of stupid. We don't do all this stuff and get God's attention, and then he makes us right. Instead, we hear this message of Christ on the cross We buy into it. We believe it. He makes us righteous in that moment. And then he starts this, here's the words, new covenant with us. We're in the New Testament, if you will. You see the issue. So he moves on with this argument. 
in 6 through 8, he says, hey, you remember way back when Abraham, the first guy, he says, Abraham, he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. In other words, be technical for just a second if you don't mind. Some of you are like, oh no. Some of you are like, yes. It's always interesting who likes what terms, right? Righteousness and justify, so related. It's that moment. It's not about being made righteous, if you will. It's about being declared righteous. In other words, you go into the courtroom, you're guilty, you've done something. It's not about going into there. It's not actually about what legal defense is set up or whatever. But if you come out of the courtroom and you have been declared innocent, even though you're guilty, that's what we're dealing with here. So you think about some of the trash, the garbage, the junk, the skeletons in the closet, all that stuff that you've been on your knees before God once upon a time. You're like, can you take this from me? That stuff's over. It's been dealt with. You did it, but now you're innocent. You need training in righteousness because God has taken it upon himself to declare you part of his new covenant people. You've been justified, made right with God. And on a given morning, such as a crowd like this, there's probably maybe a handful of you who need to experience this. And if that's true, let me tell you just a brief story. When I pastored a church back home, I was there seven years, lovely people. Uh, one of those churches where we'd have uh, frequent potluck dinners, just salt of the earth people. And I was developing a relationship with a retired businessman. He and I, twice a month, we'd go to Dairy Queen or McDonald's. Dairy Queen gravy and biscuits, the best. No? Yeah. Oh, the best by far. So we'd go to Dairy Queen or we'd go to McDonald's, get coffee, gravy, biscuits, whatever, and just talk, just hang out. I was his pastor building into them. The age difference wasn't an issue. It was more of along the lines of two guys who were connected to Christ, building in to one another. And to be honest, I, th I think it's kind of beautiful when you've got someone who's younger and someone who's older and they cultivate a relationship. And as the church moves forward, gosh, I hope we can really tap into bridging that gap, don't you? So we're going out one day and we've had this pattern for several months and I usually go to his house, pick him up. So I go down, drive in his driveway. He comes out, gets in the car. We're heading off to McDonald's or Dairy Queen or wherever. But the church that I'm pastoring, it's actually on the road out uh, to one of these restaurants. And this particular morning he says, hey, wait a minute. Why don't you just go pull down into the parking lot? I'm like, all right, sure. And thought maybe you left something at the church, right? So we pulled down there and says, let's, let's get out and go into your office for a few moments. So get out and go into the office. We go in there. I've got this chair. My desk is here. Got this chair catty cornered right over here. He just goes, turns, and just falls, like collapses into the chair. And for the next half hour, he reveals things that have happened in his life that shocked me. I couldn't believe it. And then he sums it all up by saying, now, can God deal with that? So I wouldn't be surprised if there's one or two of you in here, maybe a handful, and you've never been made righteous. And that's why we're going deeper. And we're talking about this idea of being made righteous or what it means when God justifies someone. Because just like my friend in the chair, it's the same for you. This isn't about what you have done to get God's attention. It's about hearing this message that Christ on the cross was for you. And you hear that and in ways that I can't explain and only he can do because he's God. He can work in your heart and he can work in your mind. The word of God is alive and active. It judges our thoughts, it judges our hearts. And so this idea of being justified or being made righteous, it's applicable and available for you as well. Yeah, God can take care of that. 
He can take it upon himself to justify you, to make you righteous, or to put you in a right standing with himself. And that happens apart from the law. Now, let me clarify something really quick. When we say this happens apart from the law, we're not saying that the law was bad. We're never saying that the Mosaic law was bad. Paul never had that idea in his mind. We're not saying, if you will, that it never occurred. We're not saying that obeying the law is by somehow pulling yourself up by your moral bootstraps, as I've heard it put. Instead, we're just saying the law was a covenant. And circumcision was a badge for Israel or the Jewish people that they were under that covenant. Paul says through Jesus, there's been a shift, if you will. The Gentiles, the Galatians, you and I, we are made righteous apart from the law. Our covenant is new and fresh through the blood of Jesus Christ. And our badge is not circumcision, it's belief, it's faith. Just consider Abraham. He was before the law, but he was made righteous through belief. You and I, it wasn't through the law, it was a part distinct from it that we were justified. Make sense? So if that's true, what are the implications? How will this text mess with us if that's really true. In verse 7, he says, understand then that those who believe are children of Abraham. And I welcome all emails, correspondence, brief conversations in the hall, and I take full responsibility for what I'm about to say. All who believe are children of Abraham. Through our belief in Jesus Christ, Christ on the cross, God choosing, taking upon himself to make us righteous and put us in a right relationship with him, we become true Jews. We become the people of God. We become the true Israel. We are the members of his kingdom. No matter your bloodline, no matter your race or ethnicity, no matter your lineage, Every single one of us. There's no other badge or marker designating God's people other than this idea of faith. If you have a Bible that has study notes in it, they will call this the doctrine or the teaching of justification by faith. We are the people of God. That's the marker. C.S. Lewis, I know some of you are very familiar with C.S. Lewis and you love his writings. Have you read The Inner Ring? The Inner Ring. Here's a brief excerpt from it. I encourage you to read the whole thing. It's brilliant. He's a marvelous writer, but here's a little excerpt from it. It says, you discover and you do so gradually that it exists. Slang, nicknames, manner of conversations. Those are the marks. It's not easy to say who is inside and who is outside. People think, people think they are in after, in fact, they've been pushed out or before they've been allowed in. The only certain rule is that the insiders and the outsiders call it by different names. It may be called we by the inside and from outside, they. That's why this doctrine or this teaching of justification is so important. And Paul would come to this church of Galatians and say, it's stupid, it's foolish. Who tricked you? What did they say that got you thinking a different way? It's not about anything other than your faith in Christ. That's the covenant. That is the badge. That's how God puts you into this legal forensic state of being right with him. That even though you're guilty of these sins, he declares you innocent. And that's the beauty of the gospel and the good news. So who's tricking you into thinking something else? 
Or as C.S. Lewis puts it, sometimes cliques or divisions or groups or labels pop up. And it's hard to tell who's in or out because we think of it as we and they. That's the language we use. So when justification by faith comes on the scene, and you go deeper and consider the implications, it can mess with us. Because it's not we and they. It's not black and white. It's not hourly and salary, married, single. It's not legal, illegal. It's about faith in Christ. We allow so many other things to blur that and get in the way of that message. It's easy to look out and see what the appearance looks like. We and they. But there's a righteousness that's apart from the look. And it's about this believing in Christ on the cross. Uh, My son, Christian, he's really getting into, uh, I think if he goes into one of two things in the future, it wouldn't surprise me. One is apologetics. You familiar with apologetics? Uh, apology, like in the New Testament, if you read like reasoning or a defense, those words, it's the word um, ap- apologia, which means to defend. So you're familiar with Ravi Zacharias. He knows how to defend the Christian faith, to work people through a logical, reasonable understanding of why faith in God should be faith in God and why it's okay to be a Christian. I wouldn't be surprised if Chris, my son Christian does something like that, just the way his mind works or something political, just the way his mind works. Now at the house, Michelle and I, we talk about anything and everything with our kids. We're open in dialogue about politics and we're always trying to shape them and mold them and things like that. So my son comes across one of these yard signs and we've never been uh, political activists, if you will. Uh, Being a pastor, I'm very cautious with some of those things too. I don't want to ever give the wrong impression to someone or to cause this we, they language. So Christian, you know, we're homeschoolers, so we use different opportunities to really build into them and consider things from different angles. Being in homeschool, maybe uh, politics comes up earlier or later in some of our curriculum or whatever. So Christian comes across this yard sign and he asks if we can put it up. And I'm working through it because immediately by default, I'm like, no, you know, just we don't want to go there. It causes unnecessary trouble or whatever. So I'm listening to his mind, letting him work through some of his stuff. And I'm like, you know what? Maybe I'll let him put it out for a while. I just want to see what he does with it. Talk with him about what he's feeling, why he wants to do that, things like that. So he's got this one particular yard sign. And in our cul-de-sac, there's a house this way. And they've got a yard sign and they've had it up for some time. And they're competing, these two yard signs. So I give this sign to say, Christian, give them to go ahead, go ahead and do it. So I'm peeking out the window, just watching every move that he makes and everything. And he takes this yard sign, and you know it's just those two small metal rods with that thing draped over, right? So he takes it over there, and first thing he does is he looks over at this yard. Then he turns his body and he goes, And he points that thing just boom right in the ground and says and walks back in the house. That's indicative of the world I see. Not to throw punches or add, you know, any more division to an emerging divisive country or anything. But I see that happening all the time in a metaphorical way. We and they. And we kind of hide behind these signs or they become our identity. So when someone doesn't have the same sign that we do, they, they're not we. This idea of justification by faith destroys that thinking. The covenant in which you and I live is based on faith in Christ on the cross where God, apart from the law, puts us in a right relationship with himself. So it's not about, when we read through this, it's not about getting in, being righteous, trained in righteousness, justified. It's not about the process of becoming a Christian, 
Did you, did you grow up in a Christian church? Do you remember that five finger? Anybody remember the five finger exercise? You ever heard of that? Where how do you become a Christian? We believe, repent, confess, we baptize, live a Christian life. Anybody familiar with that? Have you ever noticed how the last one's always really fast? You believe, repent, confess, baptize, live a Christian life. You gotta say it really quick, get it over with, right? It's not about that. Justification by faith is not about this process of becoming a Christian. It's not about getting in. It's not about staying in, if you will. This idea is about who is in the kingdom now. In other words, what all the Jewish people in Paul's day were waiting on God to do at like the end, God did in the middle through Jesus and it rocked their worlds. So you had a group coming along saying, oh, Galatians, yeah, you're, you're justification by faith. You're believing in Jesus. That's not enough. You need this badge of circumcision. So my challenge to you as a pastor and a challenge to myself is when we have that we, they language and we look out and there are people who are different. When you look at them, they're different, but they have faith in Christ or they practice Christianity just a little differently than we do but they have faith in Jesus Christ, that we, they language, it means nothing. One of the main, most brilliant minds of our day in terms of scholarship, N.T. Wright, he says, if Christians get this right, we would not only be, be believing the gospel, we would be practicing it. And practicing it, it's the best basis for proclaiming it. I totally agree with that. So Paul sums it up and he goes on in chapter 3, 10 through 14, beautiful passage. We're going to abridge it just a little and look at verses 10 and 13. He says, hey, all who rely on observing the law, that's what you want to be your badge or your marker, your covenant or how you want to stand before God, you're under a curse. It's not going to work out. But Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. By faith, we might receive the promise of the Spirit. So in Paul's day, being from Jewish heritage, anyone under the old covenant law, if they were hung on a tree, that didn't make them, uh, that didn't say that they were cursed because of that. Instead, they hung anyone who was guilty of one of the crimes of breaking the law or guilty of murder or something like that. Once they were put to death, they were hung on a tree to show that they were cursed by God. When we go a little bit deeper and you consider what Paul's saying here, he's saying if you are under the law, if you're not buying in or leaning into this idea of believing in Jesus on the cross, there's no other option for you to be put right with God so if you're over here under the law, you're under a curse. But Jesus, it's almost like you're on the tree showing that you're not favored by God. Jesus took our place. So what we were talking about a few moments ago, that junk or that baggage or that garbage or those skeletons in your closet, Jesus says, I'll own that for you. You come down and I'll go up. Uh, some of your Bibles, if you have those study Bibles, they call this substitutionary atonement. Christ atones for our sins. You and I are guilty, but he takes the penalty for every violation against God on our behalf. That's the good news. That's the gospel. That is the basis of our faith. That's our badge. That's our covenant. That's our God. This billboard out, I didn't know if it was true or not, so it did just a little research, and I think it's true. I don't know if you can see the, the words on it. It's a little blurry, but have you seen this? It's kind of brilliant. It's this lawyer, and he says, hey, just because you did it doesn't mean you're guilty. 
That's substitutionary atonement. That's justification by faith. You did it. I did it. But through our faith in Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean we're guilty. We're not going to receive the penalty for our sins. God is giving the penalty of our sins. He's putting all that on Jesus Christ, and that's why he went to the cross for us. So you and I right now, if you've been made righteous, if you've been justified through faith and you're sitting in one of these seats, I want to, as a pastor, say, breathe that in and live that. Allow that to inspire you. And when you leave this building, allow that to inspire you to break down walls, to build relationships with other people, regardless of the category, especially if they have faith in Christ. Let's make it more unified throughout the church in America than divisive. Because you have a gift. Romans 8, 1. He says, there is now, Sunday morning, first service, now, no, not any kind, not any hint, any level, any percentage, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you feel condemned, let's chat about it. We'll talk through it, work through it, maybe set up a time to uh, meet regularly for a little bit, coach up a little bit. But your faith in Christ sets you right with God, and we want to live out all the implications of that. Fair? Father, we thank you for the way you love us. We thank you for this idea of Jesus Christ on the cross, a message we probably really can't fully understand this side of heaven. But we thank you, Father, for what we can understand. And maybe some here this morning have the understanding that there is hope and there's healing and there's a way forward. We pray, Father, for you to prick their hearts so that they reach out to you, or that they come see me or one of our staff, one of our pastors, and we help them understand that through their faith, they're made right with you. Father, for the gift of your son, we thank you. And we praise you. Amen.